devastating. Apparently, the rapture has occurred, and Miriam's the only one they took. <laughs> 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 I gotta tell you, um, I chose this topic because I struggle with it, and not that I struggle with gratitude, but I struggle with the idea of gratitude as a spiritual practice. But on the other hand, I really like and respect Brother Dave, who's this cute little Austrian, not of the Arnold Schwarzenegger variety, but of the more towards France variety. Um, not that Arnold isn't entertaining in his own way. But, oh, he's gonna Oh, didn't make it. <laughs> I opened my eyes and thought the rapture had occurred, and you were the only one they took. <laughs> Which wouldn't be surprising. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> Except for the timing. <laughs> so, but Brother David believes that gratitude has the advantage of always being a present moment phenomenon. In other words, you, if you're going to be grateful, even if you're going to be grateful about something that happened yesterday, you're doing it right now and you're really reflecting on the impact of whatever it is you're grateful for right now. And I would agree with that. I had to think about that for a long time, but I decided I agreed with that. And I think what he's getting at in the end is that we select our own doors of perception. And so in the same way that I talk about God being a universe, well, God being one huge experience that we talk about in different ways depending on our culture and our time in history, and, and, and yet the experience is one massive experience. It's when we talk about it, we get removed from it. In, in the same way, I think, and, and, and that being a way that we select the door perception and I should develop that. So here's God. Yesterday when we were meeting we talked about God as a biochemical weapon. And, and one of the ways that you can distribute a biochemical weapon is you put it in a bomb and you explode the bomb before it hits the ground. You drop it out of a plane. Because when you do that, then the stuff gets scattered farther and drops down. And I said, well that's pretty decent analogy for how I understand the God experience, that it bursts somewhere above the ground and spreads out and covers the whole earth. But then, and people have the raw experience, but then when they start talking about it, what they have are their own cultural tools to interpret it. And so of course, if you're in Asia, Way you're going to talk about God is going to be one way. If you're in the United States, it's going to be another. If you're in South America, it's going to be another. And, and so we have the develop, and, and so on and so on. And so we have the development of these different religious traditions. And then some people decided to start saying, well, our tradition is the only right tradition. Do you notice nobody ever says, well, our tradition really is wrong? I think those people over there have. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's always, no, no, we're the good guy. And in truth, that's really a misunderstanding because if you're a monotheist, if you believe there's one God, then that one God has to be the God that everybody experiences. They just talk about that experience differently because they've been given a door of perception, if you will, through which they view God. Now, you might say, my door of perception well, in fact, I would say, my door of perception, by virtue of being born in this country, is Christianity. But I discovered that I could get a fuller picture of my personal God experience 
by looking, choosing to look through the lens of some other traditions. So I put on the Buddhist sunglasses and, and look through those. And then I take them off and I put on the, the Hindu sunglasses, which have a slightly different tint. And I look through those. And, and, and I, for a while, I look through the Orthodox sunglasses. <coughs> and yet we're looking at the same thing. So gratitude is practice set. I'm still having the same experiences. There's nothing about me deciding to practice gratitude that's going to change what happens to me. But what it will do is change the pair of sunglasses, if you will, the door of perception I choose to look through. Now, I don't believe, and I think this was one of my struggles with this, that it's just a matter of saying, oh, good, yeah, I'll do that. And then we just the next day can work. I, it takes practice, it takes condition. And one of the ways it seems to me, and I don't know that anyone associated with Brother David suggests this, but if you take a piece of paper and you write one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, seven times, and yeah, I hope you have a paper with 21 lines, or otherwise you need two. And then if each day before you go, each night rather, or day, before you go to bed, you write down three things from that day that you were grateful for. And here's the hitch. You don't get to repeat on that sheet of paper. Because it really would be cheating. I mean, you could pretty much come up with, okay, I'm grateful that I'm not dead. I'm grateful that I had enough to eat. And I'm grateful that I have a roof over my head. And you can do that on day one. But if you can't repeat on day two, you have to think a little more. And by day seven, you're really thinking. And at the end of the week, you must tear that paper up because you cannot just keep copying those same things <laughs> week after week. But what would happen, I think, is that just like looking at God through the Christian lens, the Buddhist lens, the Hindu lens, the Orthodox lens, the Native American lens, or whatever lens, the flying spaghetti monster lens. If, if you did this as a practice, what, what you would find over time is that instead of looking in through the world at the world through your cynical lens, or your bleeding heart lens, or whatever lens you're looking through, that you'd be at the at very least also able to look through look at the world through the gratitude. And I do believe that over time, that would have an impact on how happy you are. You might even say, when you look for gratitude, you're looking for evidence of God, or at least evidence of the Spirit, which is the same thing. If you're, but you're looking for God. In fact, it occurred to me in the shower the other day, which is where a lot of great things occur to me that really evidence of God is all we ever see. You know, the old, in the Old Testament, there's a couple encounters where you might say they come to decide that God has a nice butt because that's all they ever really see. Right? Moses goes and hides in the cleft of the rock. And God passes by and Moses catches a view of the backside of God. Elijah caught some views of the backside of God. And maybe that's a metaphorical way of saying we don't see God directly, but what we see is evidence of God. God scat, if you will. <laughs> God. Wow. <laughs> Just a different lens. Just a different lens. <laughs> and so that, that brings me to this gospel. Remember, every time you see Samaritan, you think dirty, rotten, half-breed. That's code language for that. Because that's what they were. They were those Gentiles, but as if that weren't bad enough, they were those Gentiles that those not very good Jewish people went and intermarried with. They had little half-breed breed offspring. And they couldn't let them near the temple. Because the religious understanding said it wasn't allowed 
Jewish people didn't intermarry. And if they did, you can't come to church. And they were crazy enough to say, my God, that's awful. And they came up with their own. But still, Jesus, well, Jesus wasn't supposed to be talking to Samaritans. And he comes across this group of people with a skin disease, as this in translation has it. They were lepers. And lepers at the time were required to actually shout, <clears throat> unclean, unclean, so that nobody would get close to them and have their nose fall off. <laughs> but enough about Michael Jackson. <laughs> um, so here come, excuse me, this, these 10 men. Nine Jews and one dirty rotten half breed. And they all get healed, and the dirty rotten half breed is the only one that comes back to express gratitude. But to the thought of the day, it should have been the other one. It should have been that the ten or the nine Jews came back and expressed gratitude. And the dirty rotten half breed, because he was such a heathen, went about on his way not expressing gratitude. And this is constant theme. Expectations are flipped. Oh, flipped. Okay. All the time. I mean, whether we're talking about the first to be last and the last to be first, you can go right, right down the list in the New Testament. It's a constant flipping, in the Gospels anyway, of expectation. And I, I really think that there's several levels on which that operates. One is that, yeah, okay, whatever you expect, you know, you can't be too locked into. But another really is, I believe, that anytime you get stuck in a particular paradigm, a particular door of perception, a particular pair of sunglasses. I had some snazzy um, yellow sunglasses once. Now, I don't know if you've ever had yellow sunglasses. I do. They're really cool. They're yellow. Yeah. It, it really changes the way everyone looks. So much so that I had to get rid of them. <laughs> but, but if you get locked into the one point of view, sooner or later you'll get complacent. And as part of that, your perspective shrinks. You get narrower and narrower and narrower. And you become a kind of fundamentalist. So, I think that walks hand in hand with gratitude. Because gratitude forces us out of looking at things the same way all the time. Particularly if we have to come up with this 21 point list of no regrets. It, it forces us into a place where we like a puppy, kind of tilts their head a little bit. Oh, what's that? What's that? And, and it keeps us experiencing the evidence of God. And that maybe prevents us from defining the evidence of God, which becomes a narrowing experience all the time. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller because we're going to define it better and better and better. And then pretty soon we can take God and stick him in our shirt pocket. And what we've got dies. So I think I was wrong about the strategy. I think it does make a difference. I think it keeps us from being in that place where we say, as these nine other folks might have, oh, well, of course I was healed. I'm a good religious person. I deserve to be healed. I don't have to be healed. You can take that point of view if you want to. But I think the result is that we start to shrink as well. And healthy spirituality always pushes us to grow. Amen.